Hello, everybody. Welcome into my latest live broadcast. Today, what's today? It's the 12th of January. It's Friday. It's 2024. Welcome in, everybody. Thank you for joining me. I see a bunch of uh, folks already eagerly anticipating the start of the video by being in the chat room and already speaking with each other there in our community, which is so, so cool. I love to see that. And already a few super chats have come in. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, but I want to tell you what we're doing today first. Coming up, we've got the review of the Mike um, Minis Forum. It's the MS-01, and this is a little mini workstation. Every single time I think there's nothing exciting coming out that I know of, and I think, oh, you know, I'll be able to come up with some of my own content. There's not much new coming out to review. I get blindsided with a product I didn't even know was coming out. And that happened here with the Minis Forum Mini Workstation. Minis Forum did some research on this. I've talked a lot about the difference between enthusiasts and hobbyists and professionals. And where you don't see a lot of hobbyist enthusiasts making videos about is, you know, things like servers and workstations. Some people think a workstation is just a regular PC. It isn't. Um, not technically. So if we, well, we could call any PC a workstation. In the business world, a workstation is a higher end. What you might consider an enthusiast build, minus all the RGB and nonsense, you know, the liquid cooling. Uh, I have seen many work, uh, I have seen full size workstations with liquid cooling that are custom built, but that's pretty rare. But essentially, you've got servers, and what connects to the servers are the workstations. And the workstations are what's getting the work done. Architects are drawing up plans for a building, and car designers are designing an engine or an automobile. Uh, they use workstations on oil rigs out in the ocean as they map the ocean floor looking for places to drill for oil some pretty high intensity stuff. So this stuff is really well equipped compared to your average consumer stuff. It's also built to a higher standard. So Minis Forum, when they were coming up with this concept, they wanted to go to the professionals, not to the enthusiasts, and to ask them, what are some features that you, know, you would like to see? We're thinking about doing this. And who did they ask but our good friend, Patrick Kennedy over at serve the home. Now, as a result of that, serve the home got the first unit and they did the first review of this. And after my review, if you'd like to see more of a business uh, angled review, be sure and check out serve the homes video review of this unit. Now, <laughs> be warned, Patrick doesn't usually make videos as long as that one is. And he's talking very quickly to get through it. And he fires a lot of information at you nonstop. And it's just chock full of good info. I can't recommend it enough. I'll put a, I've got a link to uh, serve the homes video down below. And then what I want to do today is take more of an end user approach to it, more practical approach to how we might use something like this. Um, well, it's not designed to be a gaming computer. It could be, be way overkill, but, uh, that's what we're in for today. I'm excited to take a look at it and introduce you to some new technologies we've never shown here on the channel because they're server grade technologies. So stick in the, stick around. We're going to talk about that. Hello, everyone in the chat. Hello to all my members. Hello to new viewers. And let's see, we have some super chats that have already come in. I see, I guess I better go over here. Douglas Burchell with a $2 super chat says it's so nice to be here on this great Friday. But well, we're glad to have you here, Douglas. Thank you for your super chat. 3D Everything with a $20 super chat said this MS01 looks impressive. So I'm watching this. Right on. Yeah, I think you're going to leave impressed. And maybe even learn a little something new about the other side, the business side of things. Planet Cryos with $5 in super chat said, I heard this is the place to be. So I've been here since 2016. <laughs> Hello, Gary and all. Has it been since 2016? Yeah, it's not that long. Stick around, kid. Uh, let's see. Ben Laird with a two-pound contribution says, Hello, everyone from Scotland. 
There's Planet Krios again, another super chat, this time for $10. Hello, Kerry. I'm now editing the SanDisk Professional Pro G40 Solid State Drive External SSD. It might be up tomorrow. It's a nice little unit. I did get 3,100 megabytes per second and 2,800 megabytes per second through Thunderbolt 3, of course, and about 1,050, 1,025 reads and writes for USB-C. Very good. Well, I'll look forward to seeing your review. And uh, another great channel to check out, of course, is our good friend Planet Cryos. He's got some builds and reviews on his channel. Does a great job. And uh, be sure and give him a like and subscribe. If you're looking for more content after today's video, be sure and check his channel out. If you like my videos, I think you'll like his video. Garfield Rupe with a $2 super chat. And Nick Caffrey, tribute 7 euro and 50 pence. No, is that, that's not pence. It's 757. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. $7.50 euro. I, I don't know. It, Nick says, hey, Carrie and chat, interesting video in store. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and thank you, Garfield, as well, for your super chat. There's our friend Buster joining us, Peter Laycock. Contributes 10 pounds. Good evening, Carrie and Marlia and everyone in the chat, Peter says. All the best from Bonnie, Scotland, where the temperature in Edinburgh is 38 degrees Fahrenheit or 3 degrees Celsius. Ooh, it's a little chilly. There's our friend Gregory Howard with a super chat of $20. He says, hello, Carrie and all in chat. Hope everyone is fine. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you, Peter. And, uh, um, Membership renewal, now a member for five months. Welcome in Captain Fandom Nerd on his five-month membership. Thank you so much for all of you supporting this channel and what I do here. Oh, one just came in here. Uh, Tyanor Shep with a one euro contribution. Thank you, Tyanor. All right, so today and next week also, I have got a bunch more mini PCs. Actually, I have four more mini PCs to review. Now, so far, every mini PC I've reviewed has been built for a home user or small business, universally. Some of them focus on gaming. Some of them focus on just low costs, simple needs to get online, get email, get on the web, watch YouTube videos, or stream video to your TV, things, simple things like that. It's some of them have been more higher end, what I would refer to as a workstation, not truly a workstation, but business class machine, something that's very powerful in all ways but the graphics. So that would be for business use, right? You got to write up invoices, take inventory, asset controls, um, accounting, taxes, ordering, shipping. <laughs> customer databases, communication, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this one falls into a category we've never covered here and likely won't be covering on a regular basis. The closest I've come to like business level machines would probably be the Threadripper builds. And a lot of people that buy those will use them for just over the top gaming PCs, which in my opinion is a big waste of money. Uh, aside from that, having a real server, the closest we got to that was recently when uh, Serve the Home, once again, Serve the Home comes in the picture. They had shipped a server and it wasn't packed properly. It arrived damaged. I offered to fix it. We still have that server here and it's all functional and it's a crazy amount of power, just insane amount of storage power and half a terabyte of uh, ECC RAM in that thing, which is <laughs> makes my head explode. Um, again, you could use it for gaming, but kind of like using a gun in a knife fight. <laughs> it's a little overkill. And so now the very first ever mini workstation, I don't think another one exists like this. I think Mini's Forum has introduced this concept and, uh, I'm excited to take a look at it and show you some of the enterprise technologies that are everyday use for folks in IT and professional IT in corporate America that you guys may have never even seen or heard of. Dwayne Blackwelder renews membership. Now he's a member for 14 months. Right on, Dwayne, thank you. He says hello to everyone. 
And Nick Poverman with a $10 super chat says the mini PC looks amazing. The IO, the input output on it is impressive. Oh, the IO on this is, is a whole nother thing. You could turn this into a, a mini router, mini firewall. It, it would be way overkill for that, but it has the ports for it. Now, for full disclosure, I haven't paid anything for this. Mini Swarm sent it to me. Uh, along with a couple of drives and an HDMI headless unit here, which we'll talk about what that's for, in exchange for me to do an honest review. I am not told what to say or what not to say. That's the relationship I have with the folks at Miniswarm. They're great people. I love working with them. Uh, your contributions and your memberships are what's getting things paid for. And then when companies like Miniswarm will send us product to review, will that... That's our content for one day. So here we go. This is the first time I am opening this. No, I, I take it back. I think I opened it to take some pictures for the thumbnail, if I'm not mistaken. So I believe, believe this was wrapped in plastic and we just threw that out. So I don't think you need that detail though, do you? We've got a little end, uh, card here. It says a slow boot time may be caused by an unexpected reboot to BIOS reset, RAM replacement, or solid state drive replacement. In general, the boot time will resume after one normal boot. So they're just giving you a heads up there before you file a support claim, support ticket. Now let me walk this up over to the camera and we'll talk about that IO. Looking at the front of the unit, We've got two USB 2s and a USB 3 with our 3.5 millimeter audio jack, which could be for a microphone, headphones, or a headset, which of course contains both. We've got our power button. Looking on the left and on the right, there's nothing, right? Just plain stuff, a lot of ventilation. Top and bottom, lots of ventilation. That's gonna be important. These things will run pretty warm because they're very powerful. And uh, on the back, this is what we're talking about here. We have two, uh, these are 10 gig SFP plus ports. I believe that's what they are. And then two, two and a half gig LAN ports next to two USB fours. There's only one video output here. That's the HDMI, but these USB fours, you can put these out to display ports. So you could have a total of three monitors using the two USB fours and that HDMI. You've got your two more uh, USB 3s and your barrel jack power connector there. Now, I'm just going off the top of my head on these specs. We'll take a look at, uh, at the Minis Forum site that we'll get into more detail. This is where you can insert a card like for, well, a GPU for one. It would have to be pretty, pretty small, just a one one slot card will fit in there and it'd have to be pretty low profile. Uh, there's other kinds of cards uh, that, that can fit in here as well. Uh, once again, Patrick over at Serve the Home, they tested a, over a dozen different cards to tell you what worked, what didn't work. Um, none of which would have any use for me personally, but in a business environment, I could certainly see where somebody might want to do that. Uh, we go back to the box and inside we have another box and this box contains we have some screws we have a european power cable i think, I think that's a european power cable which of course we can't use here in america but they did include a regular pc power cable for us we've got a small or short hdmi cable We've got a standoff, two standoffs for use with something I don't know yet. We've got another small box in the box that was in the box that was shipped to me in a box. And what does this have? This has a plate. Okay, well, I guess we'll have to see in the documentation what that's for. I have no idea. Um, Let's go and open the other half. So that contains our power brick. Now this is a 180 watt power brick. All right, so bear that in mind if you're thinking about putting a graphics card in here, you're not gonna be able to get a very powerful graphics card in there at just 180 watts. You might need to get like a 300 watt 
if you can find a graphics card that's low profile that'll fit. Yeah, it says 179.93 watts. It's a 19 volt. These 19 volt uh, power bricks are pretty common in these mini PCs and laptops that are fairly powerful. I'll show you the back of it. Now, do bear in mind, Mini's Forum does not make the power bricks. So that doesn't say Mini Swarm anywhere on it. And what I would do, because these are so common, if you plug one of these into the wrong device and it overvolts it or kills it, your device is just gone. So just because the plug fits doesn't mean you have the right power brick. So well, we know this is the right power brick because I just took it out of the box. This is a good time to label this as the Mini Swarm MS01 power brick. So if the two get separated, and you find this, you don't go, gee, I wonder which of my computers this goes to. Or you could have other devices, laptops, or, or other like floor lamps and such that might use something very similar to this. And uh, you don't want to play trial and, and error with these because if you get to the error side of things, you will likely fry the thing you're plugging it into and maybe even fry the power brick itself. It's no joke. So usually what I'll do if I want to go fancy, I'll get a label maker. But Sharpie, the people who make the indelible markers, they make a silver marker, which is ideal for writing on items that are dark in color. And I'll just write MS-01 right on that adapter. Do it now. <laughs> I've got a lot of mini PCs laying around here. And the last thing I want to do is mix these things up and then end up toasting something. That would be a stupid reason to break something. And I don't need this power adapter or power cable. I need this one. So this one can go in here. And I will figure out what this other little box is for here soon. So let's put this in here and put this in here. Try and clear up some of my bench space. Now. For me as a content creator, I can tell you that when I get the GPUs, the, the high-end NVIDIA or AMD GPUs, they are generally terrible at rendering my videos. They are worse. And when I mean worse, I mean they take a very long time to render my content. So to give you an example, I just pieced together the mini Slath ITX build, which was four different build videos, one after the other, over four different days. And that came out, I edited out sort of the beginnings and endings of all the, you know, part two, part three, part four, so that they would sort of align together uh, and took out some, like the introductions and things. So it just is a continual build with some discussion here and there with the audience. That's nine hours, upscaled to 4K. So as you can imagine, rendering that's going to take some time. So on the machine in back, I have a 13500 that I built here on camera. It's an i5 13500. It rendered that video out in about four and a half hours, which means it took 30 seconds to render every minute of video. If I tried that on the NVIDIA card or an AMD Radeon, it'll take about two minutes for every one minute of video. So that would take about three times longer to process. So when you're using Intel's integrated graphics, what it's coming with is something called Intel QuickSync. And if your video rendering software supports that, ooh, things move quick. So be this unit here has a 13900H. That's the mobile version of the 13th uh, gen flagship processor, which also has those same integrated graphics from Intel. And I imagine this would make an amazing video editor because it's a fraction of the size of the NZXT tower that I built in. And in theory, it should be a wonderful editing machine. Now, we talk about what's in this, what makes this a workstation. Let's go over to Minis Forum's website and see how they describe it. Now, I've got the link to the Minis Forum website for this product in our video notes. Uh, thank you to Mara for putting all the video notes and making the thumbnail for today's video. Uh, let's see, let's go to our, here it is. 
All right. So this doesn't even start shipping until next week. So we have an early review of this. Now you'll see they have, they had two different versions. They had a 12900H version and the 13900H. Both are Core i9 Intels. One's a 12th gen, one's a 13th gen. They sell it bare bone where the license, you obviously have to provide your own operating system license. And um, they have it here with 32 gigs of RAM and one terabyte of storage. And for that, that will include the operating system, Windows 11. You'll see that that total is $829. Now, when they, it's supposed to be $1,029. They're taking 200 bucks off. When this was available, it was much cheaper. Um, to go a generation behind, it was a heck of a value. Even though you're not getting the fastest, it's nothing to shake a stick at. But looks like the 13900 is the only one that's available now, which maybe this 12900 is just out of stock. I don't know what's happening with that. But you can save a little money by looking at the 12900. So this video they put on their website, this is Serve the Homes video right here. Pinnacle of Mini PC Servers, and that's the Serve the Home website there. Oh, that's pretty nice that they did. So yeah, 10 gigabit Ethernet, uh, PCIe and NVMe. The MS01 features a high performance Intel 13th Gen i9 CPU offering excellent expandability with support for up to 24 terabytes of SSD storage. It's equipped with four network ports enabling efficient data transfer. The efficient cooling design ensures optical optimal performance meeting the needs of professional users in fields such as engineering, design, and programming. It's got the Intel V Pro. V Pro is pretty much used for remote management. So if you're working at a help desk and you needed to log into any of the employees' workstations, even to a BIOS level, with the special V Pro tools, you're able to do. Uh, as we look at the details, we've got uh, onboard X710 10 gigabit dual Ethernet ports, dual 2.5 gig Ethernet ports. Dual USB 4 with 20 gig Thunderbolt Ethernet and one standard uh, PCIe interface and three M.2 slots that supports RAID 0 or RAID 1. I'm surprised I don't see RAID 5. Not exactly sure how a RAID 1 works with RAID 1 and RAID. Well, RAID 1 would require two drives and only two drives. RAID 0 would attach all the drives together as one big drive with no redundancy. So if either of any of the three drives fails, your entire system's done. So you have to replace the bad drive and completely restore without any redundancy. It's no different than having one drive and that one drive crashing if you have three drives in a RAID 0. Uh, let's see, MSO1 is equipped with the high-end Intel Core i9-13900H and the Core i9-12900H. It provides 14 cores, which is six performance cores and eight efficiency cores with 20 threads, along with 24 megs of L3 cache. The maximum clock speeds reached is 5.4 on the 13900 and five gigahertz on the 12900. It features integrated graphics. It's the Intel Iris XE with a maximum frequency of 1.5 gigahertz and 1.45 gigahertz, uh, 1.5 on the 13900. 1.45 on the 12900. It delivers exceptional performance for a smooth and responsive experience. Yeah, um, all this seems accurate. It's capable of a high-speed network experience. Okay, we've already kind of talked about that. So the 10 gigabit per second SFP plus network ports, it has two of those. 2.5 gig per second RG45. Two of those. The USB ports it has uh, enables transfer speeds of up to 40 gigabits per second. That's going to be using the USB 4.
Additionally, it's capable of building a 20 gigabit per second Ethernet network using USB 4 Thunderbolt bridge technology. VPro is uh, hardware level protection, reduces security risks between virtual machines. It supports hardware accelerations such as device virtualization for GPUs and sound cards, allowing for more efficient processing of graphics and audio tasks. Well, I don't know anything about that. I know about it from a support perspective. A little bit more about that PCIe slot. It is a Gen 4 slot by 16. We've got three M.2 slots. It also supports U.2 NVMe. Now, this is something we've not talked about here. Um, and that's U.2. Back when I was making videos for Newegg, motherboards were coming, and you might still have a board if it's a few years old, that had a funky connector next to your SATA ports, and that was your U.2. And it never really caught on on the consumer side. It is a way of putting in a basically an NVMe drive with a different interface and a different enclosure. And where it's different is it allows for a lot more power than the M.2 interface allows. It allows for much more space, meaning your drive capacities can be bigger. Well, here, let me just show you. If you take a look over, uh, we'll, we'll go to eBay and just do a search for U.2 drives. Um, well, a lot of servers will use uh, SAS drives. These U.2 drives, here, let me show you, are available in very large capacities. Now, at first glance, it looks like a regular two and a half inch SATA. Oh, but no, you could see this one's 16 terabytes. This one's 30.72 terabytes, and it's put into effectively the same two and a half inch drive case, but it has a completely different connector on the end. And you'll see these are pretty spendy. You're looking at about a hundred bucks per terabyte. Now, if you are Google or Amazon or Facebook or any large uh, enterprise company that's dealing with a lot of data throughputs, and I mean a lot of data, well, it wouldn't be uncommon for a company to have hundreds, if not thousands of these in their server farms. And um, I've got one here I can show you. Back to one. So this is what I'm trying to say. A lot of times, you know, I see the home users get excited about stuff that you don't see me get excited about. And that's because we've had that stuff on the enterprise side for a while. So a couple of things. Uh, one, well, we'll start here. This is a sample U.2 drive. This right here is a standard SATA drive. I want to show you the difference between them. If you... If you look here, this is a standard SATA drive. Take a look how that's basically two connectors, right? There's two separate connectors on a SATA drive. This, and you'll see they're the same size, right? However, if you were to accidentally buy a U.2 drive, your SATA plugs aren't going to go onto this connector, which is, if my camera will focus, one big connector. Looks pretty close. It's located more or less in the same spot. But they are, despite looking quite similar, with SATA on top, U.2 below, very, very different. For example, this is a low power device. These SATA drives that you guys use in your home computers, they're low power. These, on the other hand, these require a lot more power because they're capable of NVMe speeds versus uh, this, which is only SATA speeds, all right? So we can get NVMe speeds and get larger capacity because we have so much more room to put a bigger circuit board with more chips on it. We can have larger amounts of storage. And uh, there's a way to do this, which I will show you here. 
And then also something I've never shown on the channel before. We talk about the NVMe drives being 2280. 22 is how many millimeters wide the drive is. 80 is how many millimeters long the drive is. Well, there's also 2242, 2260, and 22110. Now, I've never in my life seen a 110. That would mean that it's like an NVMe drive that's extra long, elongated. But Minis Forum sent us one. So, they want us to demonstrate for you how we can use all three of these at the same time. We can use the U.2, the 110 drive, and the 2280 all at the same time because this has three M.2 slots. So here is what this 110 drive looks like. So compared to a regular NVMe that you're probably quite familiar with, in fact, I can just stack one on top of the other. That extra bit, that's 80 millimeters, that's 110 millimeters. All right, other than that, it's the same. Now you're probably asking yourself, how is it possible if there's three M.2 slots, these are M.2, but this is U.2. So how does that work? They've included an adapter, and the adapter is a little tray this sits on, and then it gives you, at the bottom of the tray, the little M.2 connector. And you'll see, we'll put this all together during this video, and they'll all sit side by side. Now, of course, you don't have to do that. You can use any one of the three or any two of the three. We're going to use all three of the three just to show you what it's capable of. Now, I've never opened this, but I know how to open it because I watched Serve the Homes video. And if you look right down here, there's this tab sticking out with arrows on it. If we pull, uh, push down, I guess it's like a little button. Then it should just, might have to do this on the desk so I don't drop it on the floor. But that should release the inside from the cover. Yeah, and so it does. No screwdriver needed. You're going to find a lot of toolless design in enterprise stuff because the IT department's going to be very busy. They need to get in and out. There's constant work that has to be done every single day because of the scale, just the amount of computers and storage they have. Something's failing, something needs reconfiguring. And so for the most part, the stuff is designed to get in and get out quick. Here's what the inside looks like. Now, underneath this, uh, things backwards. Underneath this fan, that's where your RAM's gonna go. This big block, that's gonna have our uh, CPU under it. It's, why is it got, it's kinda like a nice foamy, velvety cover on there. Interesting, I guess that's to keep the noise levels down. There's our PCIe slot. And then what about our storage? Well, we're gonna flip it around this way. And on the back side here, you're gonna see another cooling fan. And then right down here, M.2, M.2, and M.2. And there's our little Wi-Fi card right there that we can swap out easy peasy to get to. So in order to put M.2 drives in this or to put that uh, U.2 drive in, we're gonna to have to take this fan off of here. Likewise, in order to put RAM into this, well, this already has RAM in it, but we're gonna take this RAM out. We've gotta remove these three screws right here in order to take this off. So again, I, <laughs> I wanna say thanks again over to Patrick at Serve the Home because he showed all this and now I don't have to discover it on my own. It's kinda of like cheating, I admit. One of the reasons you'll see I avoid reading directions or instructions is because I like to figure things out on my own. It kind of comes from my gaming days, right? I don't want somebody to tell me the way to get through the next level. I want to figure it out. That's the fun of the game, right? I don't want somebody sitting next to me in the movies telling me who done it ruins the movie. But in this case, because this is so much over my head, um, and 
uh, Patrick's a friend of mine. I thought, first of all, I'm going to support my friend and watch what he's doing. But secondly, uh, as soon as he started, I'm like, oh, I didn't know this. Oh, I didn't know that. So, you know, I was glued to the screen trying to remember some of the things he's doing so that when I do my video, well, I'm not going to just parrot what he's done. I'm going to do it my way. But at least I know some of these little things like opening the cover and taking which parts have to come off, etc. And he pointed out something I also did not know, wasn't aware of, and that is because the U.2 drives require more power, and because this is plugging into one of our existing M.2s, there is a switch on here. In fact, let's do this now and I can show. And the switch is a voltage switch, so that if you're going to use that last M.2 for U.2 drives, you've got to boost the voltage on it. But if you boost the voltage on it and you put a regular NVMe drive in there, you will likely toast the NVMe drive. You'll kill it. With, you'll electrocute it effect, effectively. So that's an important thing to know, I think. So let's see, we've got three screws here. We've got one here. I've got one here. And I've got one here. When we lift this up, You'll see we've got a little pigtail for the fan that we can completely remove, which I think I will do so I can carry this over so you guys can see it. Now you're going to get a much better look at the bottom of this and should be much better able to see our three M.2s. See this switch right here? What's interesting is you do have a little label that says U.2 or M.2. And I agree with Patrick that that label should probably be up, up here or maybe etched in, because if you've got a drive covering that up, you won't see it. Hey, what's this switch do? You don't want to be doing that. So we're going to go ahead and put the M.2 drive in, or I'm sorry, we're going to, we're going to put our 110 millimeter drive in, and you can see that the, the supports here, these are your standard 2280 lengths. And down here, these are the 110 lengths. So all three of these will support a 110 millimeter length NVMe drive if you want to put one in. This is a very long heat sink they've got on the pre-installed NVMe drive, but that's just a standard 2280. As you can see, the screw goes down here instead of down here. And I guess that's what those other little two standoffs were for. Remember when I looked in the box, those would go in each of these spots here for the M.2 drives. Now, if we want to use U.2, we have to use this first or last, depending on your perspective. This slot right here is the only one that we can use the M.2, uh, the U.2 on, on this one. So when we move that switch over to U.2, it's only affecting the voltage to this one M.2. The others, you're okay with regular NVMe drives. It only changes the voltage on that last one. And because the drive is so big, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to understand why it's the last one. You see, they've got a spot here to optionally place this. And if we were to place that in, it would effectively go right about there. And there's no room for this to go anywhere else. It's the only place it could possibly go. So to do that, we need to have an adapter. So let's take a look. I'm guessing that plate, remember when I was in here, I said, what's this plate? I'm guessing that was the adapter because I didn't take it out of the package. Um, didn't see any connector on it, but let's just take another gander. 
Elko wants to know what chipset this board is running on. Uh, good question. Give me just a minute here. You open this up, take another look at this. Oh, yeah, this is it. That's exactly it. Okay, so the way that this works, I call this a plate. Yeah, it helps when you take it out of the bag and actually look at it. This is an adapter, and you'll see it's got the U.2 connector here, and then it converts it to M.2 up here. So we're going to take our drive, and we can just slide that in. Looks like there's a little cover on it. There is a little cover on here that has to come off. It's like a little dust cover. That there. Now, you should be able to just slide that in. And on the back side of this, you know, those included screws that I didn't know what those were for. <laughs> They're to hold this drive into this adapter. See, it's all coming together. So let me go and grab those screws and secure this. So there's our two standoffs. And there's our four screws. I guess I should have left all that stuff out of the box. They don't give us anything we don't need. There's really nothing spare. That box is, aside from the power cord, it's empty now. So let's cover this back up. Just leave that up there so you know what we're working on. And I'll put the box down here. Now, uh, to secure this in place, I guess we could probably go with the top-down camera. Probably be ideal for this today. I don't have Camera Girl here today, so we got to go with the Camera Girl replacement here. Replaced by technology. And it the same old story. Sorry, we got to let you go. No, I'm kidding. She's allowed to have a day off. Yes. All right, so we'll get that hooked up and turn this on. I don't know. It, for me personally, I like to see how these people make videos. You know? if you're getting a behind-the-scenes look by doing it live and also seeing some of the challenges that's, uh, that I face. That's very common for creators to face. And that's if we go here to close-up camera right there that on. There we go. like it when a plan comes together. All right, so now here's our U.2 drive. These are the bags of screws. Here, the standoffs here. The standoffs will be used in this gold circles there. That's where those will go if you're going to populate those with 2280 NVMe drives. So let's take this off here. Get these screws out of the bag. Uh, Uncle Carrie's old eyes. Gotta have my glaces. Coryman said that's a nice home lab server. Put Linux in there and run a bunch of Docker containers. You certainly can. Absolutely. It'd be very ideal for that sort of thing and not take up a bunch of room. There we go. 
Now, before I change anything on the system, I'm quite curious how they shipped it to me. It says, I've never turned this on before. So let me put the fan back on it here. And of course, you can see how that's going to go on. We've got the pigtail here that it's going to wire up to. And everything looks backwards to me, right? So bear with me for a second as I get my orientation. It's backwards. Is it this? Cable's bent left. Got to remember how I just took this off. Uh, let's see. We do have these posts sticking up that should indicate to us where this is going. Probably should have paid more attention when I took it off. I feel like, I feel like it goes on like this. Yeah, and that screw right there that holds this fan, this fan screw right here, or the piece that, this place that holds this down is also holding down our uh, Wi-Fi card here. The Wi-Fi card is, uh, I can't read it. So we will find out when we turn it on. We can go into Device Manager and we can take a look at all these specifications. Every time I rotate this, I, I lose the orientation. <laughs> so bear with me for just one second. This is a, a unique design. Doesn't go on like that. Not going to go on like that. Oh yeah, I said that piece there is the one that goes to the that holds down our Wi-Fi card and holds this piece down at the same time. Garfin. Yep. So doing this so it's underneath this camera is making me reach all the way across this bench, which is making it very difficult for me. So I'm going to go back to camera one. I do try to give you guys a good view, but at the same time, when it hinders my ability to work, then it comes across like I can't put a screw in, which, you know, in that circumstance, I can't, quite frankly, reaching too far. So let's move this aside. We'll come back to this uh, a little bit later. First, I want to put this back together so we can turn it on. Okay, so, um, glasses. Let me bring this over here where I can reach it. That should make my life so much easier. Hey, what do you know? Super easy. And then let's go ahead and secure the fan back down so we can fire this bad boy up and see how it ships to us. So for right now, because there is an NVMe drive currently in that last slot, I definitely want to move that switch back over to M.2 because that would not be a good start to our review. Uh, I had moved it because I was thinking I was going to replace it, but I want to turn it on first before I do anything else just to see how it comes. And then after we've kind of gone through the device manager and kind of looked it over, then I'll shut it back down and we'll do the uh, upgrade, if you will. That probably makes more sense. Also, if you didn't notice, there are CMOS batteries right there. So when that day comes that you got to replace the battery, it'll be super easy to get to. I was just on eBay having to buy uh, the CMOS batteries that have the pigtails on them. It's not just a bare battery. It has uh, wires connected to it with a pigtail on the end.
screw is made of aluminum. The magnet is not sticking. Good news is I found them on eBay, the CMOS batteries with the wires already on them. Like two for ten dollars. Pretty inexpensive. However, I they're probably gonna take a couple weeks to arrive, so probably want to order them and have them in inventory before you need them. They have a long shelf life. Okay, so let's just fire this bad boy up. Again, we want to make sure that switch. Double check it, triple check it. Make sure that switch is going to be in the M.2 or U.2 position, depending on what you've installed on that one slot right there. That's the only slot that affects, and that's the one they're using out of the box. All right, so M.2 it is. Oh, up front here, now that we've got the cover off of it, you'll notice this on anything like mini PCs and even some laptops. These are what Wi-Fi antennas look like these days. You see these wires? One wire comes out and gets soldered on with this pad. Both sides. One there, one there. That's what the end of your Wi-Fi antenna looks like. So do be careful with those. They do break off pretty easily. It's a thin wire. It's easy to solder back on, but best to not knock them off to begin with. And then also, if you look at the front of this with the faceplate off of it here, there's our power button. So we shouldn't have any problem turning that. Off. And the sides have a little track. And of course, now the back, its faceplate stays on unless you want to Pull these tabs back and then you can move this rear face plate if you wanted to do that for some reason. Let's see here. Plug this in right here. I'm going to leave the cover off because, like I said, we're going to do some more work to this. And uh, we'll leave the two drives out. We'll do that after we boot up. This piece here, I want to talk about this for just a second before we go much further. This may also be a piece you've never seen or heard of before. And this, you notice, has an HDMI plug on one side and then nothing. Now, what the heck does that do? This pretends like you have a monitor plugged in and turned on. Have you ever turned on a computer with a monitor turned off or not plugged in? And then after the computer boots, then you turn the monitor on and your resolution is like real basic. And that's because the system didn't sense your monitor at boot up and went to just the most basic settings. So you either have to leave a monitor on so that the resolution will be set or you have to emulate having a monitor plugged in and set the resolution on the ghost monitor, sort of like a virtual monitor. And this way you don't need a monitor on a computer that you're accessing remotely. You just have this little headless unit here. And uh, in the workplace environment, you know, you could have these all stacked up with different labels, different names. So each one then would require a monitor. So it makes more sense to access them remotely from, you know, what could be a help desk or a support desk situation. It could be in a completely different building. And with the headless display here, it thinks it's plugged into a monitor. And when you log in, you're going to get proper resolution. Is that a new concept? Anybody ever heard of that before? Uh, okay, I need a keyboard and a mouse. And uh, what else? 
HDMI. So this uses a standard PC power cable, which I have plenty of. I like to see standards. That's good. And our HDMI cable only have one video output port on here. Again, if we wanted to plug in up to two more monitors, we'd want to use those USB 4, get a cable that converts USB 4 to display port, and then from there out to a monitor. And I believe that'll support uh, 4K at 60 hertz on three monitors simultaneously. All right. Uh, the earlier question, Matt says the monitor is Wi-Fi. No, there would be no monitor. This emulates, it pretends and tricks the computer into thinking it has a monitor attached when there is no monitor. Period. It's not that there's a monitor via Wi-Fi. There is no monitor. So, for example, when you go to google.com and it brings up that website, or if you've ever logged into your router, or if you have a NAS and you log into the... There's no monitors on there. It's your monitor you're using. So it enables you, when you remote in, to maintain a, a resolution on this machine at what you want versus having it default to some really low resolution or everything's big and blocky and it won't let you change it because you don't have a supported monitor to go to a higher resolution. So in this case, this emulates, it pretends there's tricks the computer into thinking you have a monitor plugged in and allows for those higher resolutions to be set so that when you access it remotely, you get that resolution on your screen from where you're accessing it from. All right, uh, let's see. Thomas McT says, is the U.2 bigger or faster? Uh, it won't be faster. It'll be bigger. Now the, the one we have here, is, uh, let's see, I didn't even pay attention to the size. This is a 960 gig or a one terabyte, but they make these up to 32 terabytes to the best of my knowledge. And then our 110 drive, again, the bigger the, the device is, the more chips you can put on it, and therefore the larger potential. That doesn't mean that when the company sends me the product for review that they're gonna be sending me the most expensive options, right? We're just showing what's possible. So we've got a one terabyte drive here. And then this is an Intel P4511 series 1.2 terabyte drive here. But these are lower voltage, these are higher voltage. Okay. But speed wise, they should be about the same. I don't think anything here is gonna be, uh, you know, we're not, re let me be clear, we're not reviewing U.2 drives and NVMe drives. So we're not interested in how fast or what capacity. We're, we're reviewing this and what it's possible, what it's capable of. And then what you can do with it if you buy one, you wanna put those bigger, faster drives in, you can. So this is just for demonstration purposes to show you what's possible. Okay, so let me, I guess we can turn this on now, right? And oh, we're going to look up what the chipset was on this. Somebody in chat already answered that question. I see Davis Parsons joining us. There's Michael Dane. He's the man joining us in the chat. Maybe I'll just Google it. See. What chipset on Minis Forum MS01? Thought it was going to talk to me.
So it says it supports up to 64 gigs of RAM, but that's not right. It'll support 90, 96 gigs of RAM. In fact, we'll try that. We'll try putting two sticks of 48 gigs each of DDR5 in here, and it should recognize a total capacity of 96 gigs of RAM. That'll set you back about $300 for two sticks of 48 gigs each. The biggest DDR4 modules, whether they're laptop modules or desktop modules, is uh, 32 gigs. So if you only have two slots, you can only have two sticks of 32. That means your maximum is 64. DDR5 goes to 48 per module. So if you go 48 and you have two slots, total of 96. Now, I've never used 48 gig modules before, so that'll be a first for us coming up a little bit later in today's video. Nick Poverman mentions, the, mentions that the U.2 uh, drives handle more users at a time without bottlenecking. Appreciate that info. That's all out of my experience. My, it's out of my wheelhouse, so I appreciate that info. Um, but yes, if you're running a server, multiple people all trying to access something at the same time, you definitely want your I.O. to be able to multitask. Um, Hey, there's Mats Olaf joining us from Sweden. Paul O'Brien says hello, joining us from Ireland. Um, I'll tell you what. Since Mara's in the chat room, I'll have her look up what chipset this is so I can boot this up and we can move forward here because I'm not sure. And I might, once we've got it booted up, I might be able to uh, look in the device manager and see it. Mark Gaines just sent $24.36 via PayPal. Mark joins us from Northern Ireland. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for your continued support. I really appreciate it. Okay, so anticipation. Let's go over here. Let's turn on my HDMI input. Let's put me in the corner. Okay, smoke test. Turn it on. Got a blue light up front. Technically, I've got this upside down. Really should go this way. Fan is spinning. No, but I just keep it vertical. And both sides can breathe. It's whisper quiet. Like, I, aside from the blue light, I have no idea that it's on. Okay, here we go with our out-of-box experience, our first time setup with Windows 11. I'm gonna click yes. 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 Skip. Don't have internet. Continue with limited setup. Accept the license agreement. Put in the username of user. Next, password blank, so we go right in our desktop. Turn off all the telemetry here except for location settings so our date and time kept up for us. And it finalizes our install. Okay, so now we're just gonna wait for this process to complete. If you're a regular viewer of this channel, you've seen this countless times. However, with the power and performance of the system, I imagine it shouldn't take very long at all.
Ben Laird says 96 gigs of RAM. Windows 11 runs fine on 16 gigs. Well, if all you use is Windows 11, then that's probably all you're going to need. But if you're using any AutoCAD or serious resource-intensive application software that people would use in an, an enterprise environment, that extra RAM can really make a, a dent in the performance. It can not a dent in a bad way, but it can boost your performance, especially as I mentioned, like when I edit videos, having that extra RAM is probably way more than I need. But that also means that while a video is rendering, I could probably go and surf the web and do other things and not even notice that the machine's rendering a video. It could make, in theory, it could make that big of a difference where you're multitasking, don't even realize it. So just know it's there. It may not be for you, but it's possible, right? Now, we're going to verify that again a little bit later. If we go into our device manager, I'm kind of curious of a few things. Uh, do we get Windows 11 Home or Pro? I would assume Pro. Now, Minis Forum did tell me that all their machines that they're selling from this point forward are all going to contain Windows 11 Home. Period. End of story. I thought maybe since this is a business class workstation that it should have Pro on it. It does not. So bear that in mind if you're going to use it in a business environment. Need to log into servers. If you need those business features, we'd want Pro. On the other hand, uh, if this is a home lab type situation, then probably home is fine. Now they've included 32 gigs of RAM in this review unit here. Again, that's two sticks of 16 DDR5. And if we go to our device manager, We can take a look at what our network adapters are. So got to keep in mind, we've got Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and two Ethernet, and two SFP Plus ports. So that is a lot of Wi-Fi. That's a lot of uh, internet I.O. So you'll see we've got the, um, the Intel i225V, which is sort of your standard um, Ethernet controller you find in a lot of consumer-based stuff. Then you've got your 225LM. That's more of the business side of things. Here we've got the SFP ports here, the X70. Is that what it says? X710. I can't see it from this far away. Those are going to be our SFP ports there. Yeah, X710. And then we've got an RZ616 Wi-Fi 6E. Uh, that's not Intel. Okay, well, that's fine. You just think they would have gone all Intel. It all works the same. So uh, with regards to the chipset, let's see, what can we do here? Let me plug it into the internet and go for some updates. I guess I need to come at it the other side. Matter either one of those will work fine for our purposes. I need to wait for that little globe down in the bottom right to look like a little monitor. That'll happen just right now as it uh, gets an IP address automatically from the router. Set up with it. Drives me crazy. So let's do the Intel driver uh, assistant. Let's download that. That's going to give us a bunch of information about this little mini, this little mini station. It's uh, a nice alternative to CPU-Z while at the same time also check that we have the latest version of drivers for anything Intel related, whether it's Ethernet, video, uh, chipset, etc. Decline that one. Yes, here. Close this. Let that install. It should have some information here soon.
this and analyze our system here. Tell us what we've got. Well, that was quick. So we do have a new video driver available. So we'll go ahead and download. If we scroll down, we're going to get a bunch of details here. So BIOS information, motherboard information, processor, graphics, networking, memory, storage. That's not chipset either, huh? Peter VZ, now a member for seven months, says hello, Carrie and chat. Hey, Peter, thank you for continuing your membership with us. This is all the information on the processor. Memory. that download. Ben Laird says, is there a support assistant for Ryzen? No, no, there isn't. You would just use um, AMD's Adrenaline software, which is more like chipset driver software, but uh, AMD does not offer that. That's an Intel only thing. Jim wants to know if BitLocker encryption is enabled. So with Windows 11 Home, there is a default to enable encryption. And if you use the Rufus, the free Rufus download, you can make your own Windows 11 bootable USB flash drive installation media rather than using Microsoft's tool. In fact, you would still use the Microsoft download tool and download the ISO image. Then grab Rufus and make your bootable USB with that ISO image. And the minute you go to start, Rufus says, wait a minute, this ISO image is an ISO of Windows 11. Would you like to turn off the requirement of, you know, needing a network, you know, so you don't have to do the shift F10 thing? Would you like to disable the automatic encryption? And you can check those boxes. And then when it makes your... Uh, installation media for Windows 11, it will have those features disabled by default. Just so you know. But if we go down here to search and we can type in encryption, data encryption here. Um, it's core isolation. That's not what I want. Encryption. Not doing anything. Script offline files. Not getting anywhere with this stuff. Uh, let's just try BitLocker. Manage BitLocker. Nothing's clicking for me. Might have something open in the background I don't see. I want to get rid of that little cartoon thing there. So I type in search permissions. History. Settings. Turn that off. Because that really, that thing down there annoys me. So we'll turn that off. Okay. It's not going to be in the carry. Again. Ah, it's bringing up a website.
Yeah, that just brings up a website because BitLocker isn't really included with Windows 10 Home, but it's an encryption. Bit different. They'll call it BitLocker, but it's, it's encryption. So it should have been type encryption. Okay. Oh, that's where I was before. Where is that setting? This was introduced, this default turning on this encryption on Windows 10, uh, Windows 11 Home on the last big um, 22H2, I think, is when they introduced that. Let me cheat. Look it up. How to turn off encryption Windows 11 Home. Search for device encryption settings. Device. Setting. Where the heck is it? Seeing any options. It's in disk management. I guess that makes sense. Let's go to disk management. Um, I, I've seen this before. I've only seen it once before. Oystein said, I had to turn off device encryption before I could back up my drive with a Cronus. Yeah, absolutely. Poverman says, go to the C drive and right click. Then what? Security. I, I've done this, but I remember there was a, a slider that was turning the encryption on and off. We can install this. This is finished. There's my delay here. What's this? Please restart your PC now to continue installing updates. Oh, I think there was some updates going on in the background. Okay, that's fine. We'll let that do what it needs to do. The setup of a new computer, you know, you need to give yourself a little bit of time there. Uh, I don't deal with encryption on Windows 11 Home because I used Rufus to make my Windows 11 boot media. And again, all you do is you download your ISO image as you normally would from Microsoft using the uh, Windows Media Creation Tool, but just tell it you want the ISO image. Save the ISO image on your hard drive. Go to Get Rufus, Start Rufus. 
point it to the ISO file you just downloaded, point it to what flash drive you've plugged in that you want it to write to to make bootable, and as soon as you hit the write button to start, the options will come up. There's four different options, and I select two of them. One is to not require a network and the other one is to disable the encryption so when you see me installing windows 11 it's already set that way by default and it doesn't take any more time to burn the image you know what i mean to make it Nick Boverman says, if I right mouse click the C drive in File Explorer, all right, well, we'll go up to File Explorer here, right click. You'll see Manage BitLocker. So you shouldn't see that option in Windows 11 Home because Windows 11 Home doesn't come with BitLocker. It does have an encryption, but it's other places are calling it BitLocker. Microsoft is calling it encryption, which is different from BitLocker. So it's, what I have seen, uh, my personal experience with this, is there was a section that said um, um, encryption on or off. It didn't say BitLocker on or off. That, that was a Windows Pro thing. Oh, you want me to show more options? Okay. Good point. Let's see if it's in there. It's not, and nor should it be. Like I said, it, Windows 11 doesn't come with BitLocker. It's, it's an encryption. And the encryption is turned on by default. And it's third party, like Acronis and others are going to say you've got encryption turned on. They might say you've got BitLocker turned on. Instruct you to turn it off. And as I recall, it was very easy. It was just a little slider. And I'm sure I had to do it for the same reason where I couldn't clone the drive with that turned on. So if we go to, once again, I, I typed encryption, data encryption. Maybe it is under, is it under core isolation? No, that's memory integrity. Access. Can't remember, I found it. It's also possible that it wasn't installed on here. Because I remember when I looked for it, it was really easy to find. I didn't struggle. So, um, Mara says she's not finding any official discussion of the chipset or motherboard. Now, maybe I can install that video. All right, we'll let that install, and then we'll have some more Windows updates to install, and we can do our upgrades. With regards to chipset, we'll have to look into that. Jim KJ3N said, I was surprised when I looked at my drive on my laptop using disk management and the word encrypted showed up on the C partition. Yeah, it'll say encrypted. It's not BitLocker. It's something different. You'll have to Google it to learn more about it. But it will install with encryption turned on by default. Unless, as I mentioned, you use Rufus to make your own, uh, or you do it by hand, but Rufus does it for you, to make your own Windows Media install. Or you can just go in, uh, as Jim mentioned, if you're running Windows 11 Home. This is a Windows 11 Home issue. You can turn that off. If it's, um, it's one of those things that it can make like imaging the drive or accessing the drive outside of the computer difficult. So let's say that the computer fails on you. 
and you want your data off of the off the drive, you won't be able to read it. So again, this is why backups are useful. But if you're doing like a clone where you're outside of the operating system, booted from an Acronis rescue, it cannot read the drive. It's encrypted. So you got to, Acronis will tell you, you've got to turn that encryption off. As long as you maintain regular backups and you're not cloning the drive, you can safely leave the encryption on. It's there for your security. But much like things for your security, people often lock themselves out of their own computers. So you decide what's right for you. Gary Tatum said the data encryption option was on the same page as core isolation and evidently it was not installed on this machine. All right, thank you, Gary. I appreciate that information. I know it was easy to find when I went looking for it. Uh, when I was cloning with Acronis, it told me to disable it and I'm like, shouldn't be anything on there. It's Windows 11 Home, but it's not BitLocker. It's encryption. It's, again, I know it's confusing. It's Microsoft. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Um, by installing it by default, Microsoft is just kind of forcing a higher security standard and you can disable it if you want to you can leave it enabled if you want to. It's your choice, whatever your preferences. Uh, John suggests CPU-Z can detect the chipset. All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll grab CPU-Z. We'll give that a shot. I got my flash drive right here. I got to copy some utilities off of this anyway. I figure out which direction it goes in. There we go. All right. Let's see. I want. Let's see. What's this? Let's drag that out. Not that. Oh, there goes my video driver getting replaced. And let's see, I want so PC Manager. So Windows 10 Optimizer. Yes, that works on Windows 11. I want to go into PC Testing Software and copy over Crystal Disk Info. Crystal Disk Mark. CPU Z. Run CPU Z. See if it tells us what chipset we've got. I'm trying to think when I look at the CPU Z pages in memory, I don't recall it telling me the chipset, but specifically looking for it. So this is all about CPU under our main board. Chipset Intel. What does that say? Well, that was rude. Did it again. Might have to wait for this driver to finish installing it. It keeps trying to take screen focus. <laughs> it's angry. Maybe if I just move it out of the way. Let's try that. Chipset, Raptor Lake. Give us a number, though. Hmm. Good question. All right. Matt says if you want to back up the drive, you have to turn off BitLocker. No, 
If you're backing up the drive outside of Windows, so in other words, booting to like an Acronis Rescue Disk, you're not in Windows. This is own environment. Once you're outside of Windows, you can't read an encrypted drive. It's got to be uh, booted to the installed operating system, and then it, uh, it decrypts as you're using it. It encrypts and decrypts automatically. We'll save that for another show. It's not for today. We don't want to pull this off the rails into a total different direction. Obviously, you can do some Google searching on this. This topic has been covered for the last five or six years. It's, it's not like the information's not out there. Do a Google search. Look here on YouTube. Uh, a lot of people have explained it. We can certainly explain it ourselves in a future show, but it's clear to me that some people just are overthinking this, and it's going to have to be a longer video for me to get people to stop overthinking it. You can back up your computer just fine while you're in Windows. If you want to turn the encryption off, it's up to you. You can leave it on. If you need to access the drive outside of Windows and encryption is turned on, you will be able to. That's what encryption does. It's protecting your data from theft. So again, you can search for that if you want that information today, or you can remind me in the comments that you'd like me to cover that, and we'll set aside a day where we can talk all about that, the pros and cons and the hows. And it's pretty much an issue with Windows Pro versions. They only Microsoft only recently introduced this encryption to Windows 11 on 22H2. And again, if you go back and read about 22H2, this was talked about back then. So, all right, let's get back to our review here of the MSO1. Now I've got the new video driver installed, so let's go ahead and reboot that. And still a valid question is, you know, what chipset does this have? So uh, we need to send an email, I think, over to our contact at Minis Forum. And, uh, that might be the, the best way to get that information. George Frugia says, with an Intel Arc and an Iris XE driver, do you need to install a graphics card or it works without? Well, we already have a graphics card installed that's built into our CPU. So if you, in addition, have a graphics card, you would download the same driver for Intel's uh, Iris as it is, I believe the Arc driver shares the same platform, if I'm not mistaken. But just because your GPU is installed on your CPU does not mean you don't have a GPU. That's what we call a integrated graphics card versus a discrete graphics card. Not all CPUs have integrated graphics, but when you see me building, I always make sure I buy CPUs that have integrated graphics. Because me as a content creator, it actually benefits me more. And graphics cards, as we all know, are very, very expensive. So I would prefer to not use them. I also don't like to ship computers with uh, discrete graphics cards because they just don't hold up well in shipping and it's kind of risky. Let me throw VLC on here real quick. I just want to configure this the way I would normally configure. Okay, that. Cheer. Close that out, and then I will use Windows 10 Optimizer. We'll run that real quick. And then while well, I'm waiting on this, let me do a quick search here. Dan Nilsson with a $10 PayPal contribution. Thank you, Dan. Um, we want to know chipset, Minis Forum, S-01.
I'm just looking to see if there's any discussion. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty strange. Pretty strange that the, the chipset's not mentioned, and I don't see anybody asking about it. That's the other thing that's strange. Uh, I'm sure it's not a secret. It just appears to be an oversight for some reason. Get this MS uh, Microsoft PC Manager installed. It's on all systems now. It's a great little maintenance utility. It's free for Microsoft. It just ties in all of your Windows maintenance tools into one convenient interface that you can set to auto run. So I usually just uh, install it and then set it to automatically run when needed, which I'll demonstrate here. You can follow through my steps. Click on Launch Now. Click on Start. Boost. Go up here to that Smart Boost. Turn that on. All done. So I like having that. It's a nice little maintenance tool. I can delete the installer here and here. Now, with regards to the drive that we're using, that we're booting from, this NVMe drive, you can get a little bit of info here. So the drive they've included is a Kingston. This is a one terabyte NVMe drive that's got the heat sink on it that I showed you earlier. And if we run Crystal Disk Mark on that, see what kind of numbers it gives us. There's PSE Computers Missouri joining us. Good afternoon, Kerry, he says. Colder than a well digger's hind end in Missouri. <laughs> Gonna be in the negatives tonight for temps. Thanks for the tech info. Always appreciated. Well, thank you for the <laughs> weather update. Sounds chilly. Hey, that thing moves pretty good. We got some Gen 4 speeds going on here on this uh, included Kingston NVMe drive. Paul O'Brien contributes five euros. Says, buy Mara a pint of water. What can I say? Government doesn't give me much money. What's wrong? Tap water is not good enough for her? All right, so we still have to figure out chipset this thing. And PSC Computers Missouri contributes $10. Thank you, PSC Computers Missouri, for your contribution. Douglas Brichel says, tap water, what's that? Might actually be healthier for you. You know, they're finding microplastics in bottled water that can get into your cells in your blood. But, you know, you only live once, so it tastes good. Enjoy it. Uh, yeah, where else can we determine a chip set? Probably should be some piece of software that will tell us. How to determine chipset? How to identify, go to device manager, type, go to system devices. Oh, I suppose that's true. Right click. 
Device Manager, System Devices, Usually it's located right there by the uh, LPC controller, right in the title. I say, didn't it well, apparently. You know what? Let me go back over here. Not that often I get puzzled like this. That's a good question. <laughs> Just that the answer is so difficult. Uh, you think that would be straightforward. Let's go back over to this form site here. Now this hasn't been released yet, so don't know if they're changing or adding anything to the website here, but sometimes it's a specifications tab and I'm not seeing it. Yeah, we're going to have to just eat. That's what it looks like. So uh, basically what that means is you'll want to um, check the video notes in a few days below the video, and we'll be sure to add what the chipset is in the video note. Elko says, I never expected my question to be so intriguing. Yeah, sometimes the easiest questions can be the most difficult ones to answer. Uh, who knew? Okay, so let me, um, oh, you know what I can do? I can message uh, Patrick over at Serve the Home. Do you happen to know what chipset? MS01 All right, so Patrick probably knows. All right, now, as we're approaching the two hour mark on this video, you know, I like to wrap these up at the two hour mark. So I wanna move quickly now through the rest of this. So what we wanna do is, um, I'm gonna close this down. Oops. 
take this screen here and what is it? Function of screen paint. The file, save as egg still disk mark on the Kingston terabyte and dot JPEG. Save that on the desktop. Boom. Okay. Now I can close this. And I, and I want to verify. Did have 32 gigs of RAM installed, yes? Go over here to system. Yeah, we've got 32 gigs of RAM. Let's upgrade that to 96 gigs of RAM. Once again, this is a, this is a brand new experience for me. So uh, share in this first time experience together. Kind of intimate and special. Such a nerdy thing to say. Okay, so with it powered off, I'm gonna pull power here just for safety. And let's grab our overhead virtual Mara camera. I'll turn that back on. Yikes, tighten that up too tight. About there should be good. And over to the close up camera. Here we go. All right. So, to get to the RAM, we've got to remove these three screws. Oh, Netfreak just sent an Amazon gift card for $2. He says, we appreciate your patience and time. Thanks, teacher Carrie and assistant Marilena. Well, right on. Well, thank you, Netfreak, for supporting the show. All right, here we go. This is uh, too big of a screwdriver, so I'm going to need to grab my uh, precision drivers. And I want a Phillips head. Should be it. Wow, those are really super tiny screws. We're a little spoiled with the, the HP mini PCs, how the fan just lifts out. No tools needed. So not sure why they decided to do that here. But not that big of a deal. This must pull up in a way, I'm guessing. Something is holding. There it goes. Okay, so there's the installed RAM we have now. It's crucial. It's a 16 gig module that's uh, 5600 speed DDR5. So let's pop that out. Get another one there, facing the opposite way. That one out. You can see our CPU heat sink there. And then what we have right here, this is the good stuff. It's the 96 gig kit. Each stick is 48 gigs each. What did I say? Did I say 48 gigs before? It's 48 gigs. If I misspoke earlier.
If I misspoke, I may not have. But if I did, that's what I meant to say. Because <laughs> when I cover my bases. Uh, these are run about 150 bucks for each module right around there. So you're looking at $300 for 96 gigs of RAM. At least I, that's what I paid here in uh, mid-January of 2024. 48 gigs. Six hundred speed. So same speed as what we took out. Pop that in there like that. The other module. That one's gonna go label side up. That should be it. Should be our install for the RAM. Put the screws back in it. Okay, in theory, should have 96 gigs of RAM. Put this back in. Back on. Light is on. CPU, uh, that RAM that I just, uh, this is our CPU fan that our RAM is underneath. I just removed that, that's spinning. And I need to go over to our HDMI input now. And bear in mind that this could take, remember it had that warning that if we change the RAM, there could be a delay in the boot up, not to freak out. So if I can get camera one shrunken down here, um, it's important that you're patient, that you don't freak out and think, oh no, you know, my, my RAM is bad. Basically, when the system turns on the very first time after you've replaced your RAM, sometimes even after you change storage, in the case of RAM, it's got to retrain the RAM. And the bigger the RAM module is, and the more of them you have, the longer this can take. So we're going to give this upwards of three to four minutes if needed. And hopefully, It'll train and it'll post. And then from that point forward, it'll be fast. It's just that first time. Over here to the chat room, see what you guys are saying here. Looks like we've got about 316 people watching around the world. Let me know in the chat where in the world you are watching me from. Well, something's starting to happen. There we go. See, that took a, a while. A lot of people are used to that instantaneous. If it doesn't happen, their impatience can create a problem. So it's very important you know what to expect so you don't cause a problem where there would not have been one if you'd have just been patient. Can't emphasize that enough. Now, if we go over to, let me see, screen A, go to my system properties here, right click on the start menu over to system, 96 gigs of RAM. So even though it said the maximum was like 64, we'll let them know they need to correct that because they're kind of underselling the device. There's our 96 gigs, that easy. Now, when it comes to installing the U.2, Let's do that now. So let's go ahead and shut this down. And I'm waiting for the power to go off there. And we'll go back to full screen on one. Plug the power anytime we're working inside of it, just because there's always voltage running through there. As for these modules, I will save these. They can be used in something else that takes DDR5.
so as to not confuse myself, get my ever famous Sharpie marker out. Make a note that this is 32 gigs of DDR5. So I'll scratch out the 96 and make it 32 gigabytes. And that will go back over on the part shelf for some future project down the road. You'll see it again. <laughs> Just a matter of time, you'll say, I recognize that RAM. All right, now let's get this which way now. I want to go back to this back side and we're going to take this fan off again. I'll do this on the wide angle camera since before you had that top down view and my hands, of course, get in the way of that. I did use the bigger screwdriver, but these precision drivers are actually a little appropriate for this work. Okay, now we'll bring out the overhead. Talk about what our options are here, some decisions. Elijah 52 Dickens, now a member for 16 months. Right on. Thank you, Elijah 52 Dickens. We got people watching us uh, in Ireland, just south of Dublin. The Netherlands, North Carolina. John Pallack joins us originally, says from Oak Park, Michigan. That's where I was raised. Cord Oliver joins us from Iowa. Michael is in South Wales in the UK. MDD1963 joins us in Okinawa. John Williams in Madison, Wisconsin. 3D Everything is in Sacramento, California. Joni Minen is from Finland. Gil Garcia joins us from Texas. Ben Laird from Scotland. Timothy Runquist from Surprise, Arizona. Luke Greenia joins us from Vermont. Scott is in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Matt says he's in Illinois, just outside of Peoria. Bronx says he's in cool Jamaica. Eddie Casanova from Philadelphia. Dan Nelson from Sweden. Kurt Schlegel in Aurora, Colorado. Douglas Burchell in Oakland, California. Gerhard Huff is from Germany, and Andrew Norman from Australia, Andy Crabtree from Arkansas, Artur Resenen in Finland, Oystein joins us from Norway with Mr. Rick in Sweden, Sherry McFarland in Northeastern Ohio, Mark Baggett joins us from Massachusetts, Massachusetts, Jason Willis joins us from Fresno, California. Thanks for the shouts out from where you guys are watching from. It's just Incredible that we can broadcast worldwide like this live. Alan Lindus joins us from Arizona. Steve Dodd is now a member for 14 months. That's awesome. Thank you, Steve. Dustin Fuller says he's in Clay Township, Township in Michigan. Safari says he's in Argyleshire, Argyleshire in Scotland. Right on. Andrew Norman in Brisbane, Brisbane Australia. Netfreak said he was born in Guyana. Great grandparents are from India. Traveled in South and Central America for 13 months nonstop. Ended up in Mexicali, Tijuana, Baja, California. Then went to Europe to continue, but stuck here. All right. Seems like a good place to be stuck. Paul Connolly says hello from Austria. And Elijah 52 Dickens says they're watching from D.C. Essential working too hard in southwestern Connecticut. Russell Stewart is in Kansas City. Is that Kansas City, Kansas or Kansas City, Missouri? I never quite know. All right, let's go to close-up camera. Okay, so here's the deal. We've got three M.2 slots here. And we need to use this M.2 slot if we want to use our U.2 drive because that's the only place it's going to fit. Also, when we install this, this drive, you know, the larger capacity drives may be thicker. You, you won't be able to put this back on uh, 
you won't be able to put the cover back on if the drive is too thick. So I don't want to mislead you into saying you could buy one of those larger capacity drives. You'd need to check how thick it is to make sure that um, it's not going to raise above this lip. So let's start by taking out current boot drive here. We're just going to move this over. We can still use it. Let's take this out just momentarily. Let me set it down. You can see how they've got these rubber bands holding on this heat sink. You can buy these heat sinks, something very similar on AliExpress. Very inexpensive. I'm not quite sure how good of a job they do, but something may be better than nothing. And if we wanted to use this, we would plug it in here. See that? But notice where it, our switch, U.2 and M.2. When we put this in, you can't see that label that tells us what that switch does anymore. And that screw that I just took out can now go, actually take that back. The screw we just took out, take a look here. Yeah, we're going to leave that screw out because that screw holds the fan down, right? That one there. So we're going to be in M.2. Um, we're going to be in U.2. So we want to be on the right side. Dot two. Then plug this in. I'm curious. Do we use that? Is this going to tie down? I remember how I took this off. It's kind of like that, right? So this screw that holds down this plate will also hold down the drive in this corner and this corner and those appear to be the only two screws i do see there's a cut out there but nothing for it to go down into so that's fine that'll work fine so then we're we're going to repurpose the screw that we just removed and we've got our 110 drive here we can to make it look aesthetically pleasing just have it go like in a like a graph. <laughs> so we'll put this 110 M.2 in here like this. Tighten that back down. And if we want to put this drive back in, our boot drive, we can put it here, but we will need to put the little standoff in. So in the bag that came with uh, the computer here, we've got two standoffs each, but obviously we don't need it here. Ooh, they're super tiny. Very, very tiny. So that's going to go there. Okay. And our original boot drive, we can now put back in. Just like that. There's this screw that we took out. It was originally holding this drive in, and we'll leave those, leave that other one in there so I don't have to worry about it.
Okay. Now, in theory, that's fully populated with three different types of storage devices. We've got our U.2, our M2110, and our M280, uh, 80, 80 millimeter, 110 millimeter. Okay, so we can't put this back on. You see how this fan sticks out? It's hitting this heat sink here. So this heat sink has to come off and because it's gonna be directly underneath the fan, it's not really going to be needed. So we're gonna pop this off and take the heat sink off. If anything, we might move the heat sink over to the other unit. Or, no, I would still get in the way. So this should be super easy to take off though, these rubber bands. Stuck on there pretty good. It's easier to do this when they're warm. Be gentle with it. You don't want to rip the chips off. Of it. So we can repurpose that heat sink. And then here's the information on this M.2 drive that was covered up. Now let's put that back in. That's better. Now it looks like through me wiggling all this stuff around, I've actually damaged my cable here. Looks like my ground wire right there. If you look closely, disconnect this. I have to do myself a little repair. See, we've got a a little cable right there has come out of its holder. But as long as the fan still spins, that's all I care about now, and I can fix that later. Yeah, you got to be gentle with this stuff. There. one over here. Having a little alignment issue here. It's better. Okay. Now we'll plug it in if the fan doesn't turn well then i'll have to uh prioritize getting my little soldering iron out and fixing that however if the fan is turning i'm not going to worry about it for now but i will address it later so plug this in now 
and put it on its side. Let's go back over to camera one. This camera A. Turn this on. Back over now to HDMI input. Once again, I will put myself in a corner here. Now, in theory, it should try to boot from each of these drives, and since only one of them is bootable, it shouldn't have to go into the BIOS and tell it. And that does appear to be working. Is my fan back here spinning? No. Spinning. Yeah, that black wire is needed. So when I attach it, the fan spins. So I'm not going to keep this on too long with all the heat that's going to be generated from all three of those drives. But they do have uh, thermal throttling, so break them ready. Yeah, that's an easy fix. Let me um, go full screen over here. Full screen. Let's go to disk management. And it should see the two new drives, and it does. So we're just going to click OK. Right click on the first one, new simple volume. Next, 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 finished. Right click on the next one, new simple volume. Next, next, next. So I did that too quickly. It's our volume D, volume F. Now, that's all three storage drives installed. And if you want to see what the BIOS looks like, I'll show you that, and then any remaining questions that we can answer, and then we'll wrap it up. So I'm going to hit restart, and then I'm going to go Press delete over and over again. Okay. Now this BIOS entry screen is very familiar to us. It's um, when we saw on the uh, XTX system that we just reviewed two weeks ago, same thing. We'll go under setup. And here you can see our first page in the BIOS that we're defaulting to with our BIOS version, our installed RAM, this memory frequency, date and time. We go down to advanced uh, with trusted computing. CPU config. Uh, C states enabled. We've got the power limit one here at uh, 60 watts, it looks like, and 80 watts on power limit 2, PL2. Which I guess you can adjust, but if you make those numbers bigger, you might be running into heat issues. Go back. Or device setting. 
primary display, internal graphics, aperture size, HD audio, S5, PCIe support, PCH, PCIe support, Mac. Settings. Hardware monitor and fan monitor. Clearly our uh, two fans are not working. And I leave all these defaults because the engineers have determined what's going to be the best overall under any weather, room temperature, and usage scenario. And of course, you can adjust those if that's something you want to play with to your specific environment and needs. It's a little bit of a, a PXE support in there, which I don't boot from the LAN, so there, and then it's an Atlas Western Digital NVMe is configured. It's our two drive. Firmware map. Oh, that's interesting. So that's for the uh, two drive. I'm guessing. Ethernet or considered the add-ons here. And under security, you've got your standard security stuff there. Under boot, um, again, pretty much boilerplate options here that are very common. MEBX, I don't know what that is. Intel M password. So I don't know what that is. Of course, we have save and exit. Changes, discard. didn't make any changes, so just discard and boot. Okay, so hopefully the camera one image didn't cover up much in the, the text of the BIOS there. I just realized I left that. Uh, are there any final questions that you have about this little mini workstation? Uh, bearing in mind that it is going to be running at Gen 4 speeds, okay? So the question regarding the U.2, really about power consumption capacity, not so much about performance. Our performance is going to be di dictated by our interface, which is still Gen 4. And with Gen 4, on the high end, you can expect up to 73, 7,400 megabytes per second if we spend big bucks on a high performance drive, which of course will generate more heat. So you gotta be conscientious of your heat in a system like this. With regards to any add-in cards, what GPUs might work, or if you wanna to go to a 25 gig uh, SFP controller, and you can put a controller in there. Uh, lots of different cards, you gotta pick one. Some of which are not compatible, either because they're too large or they draw too much power. Um, some may require, in the case of a GPU, if it fits, it may require a bigger power brick to power it. So Patrick over at Serve the Home, also on their forum threads, they've got a whole discussion of what cards they've tested along with viewers that have tested cards that adds to a growing list of what's working, what's not working, and may give you ideas uh, outside of a GPU for other things you could use that slot for that perhaps you hadn't considered. We will, as I mentioned, reach out to MIDI's forum and find out what that chipset is. And I did reach out to Patrick as well. Let me see if Patrick has responded. Patrick says Raptor Lake P is the chipset. So it's an integrated PCH. The i9-13900H is a mobile SKU, so it is integrated. So Raptor Lake P. So, interesting. Thank you, Patrick. Learn something new every day. So there we have our answer. Okay. Hmm. 
All right, I think that that's going to cover it for today's show. I want to shout out another thank you and a reminder that the folks over at Acronis are supporting us this year. And if you're not making backups or you're not confident with the backups you're making, you should absolutely consider getting Acronis. We have a discount for all viewers, 30% off throughout the entire year. So, you know, if you can't get it today, you gotta wait till you get paid. Coupon code, we're gonna keep that around all year. It's gonna get you a one year subscription. We're gonna bring folks from Acronis on. Uh, likely, but Gowden will come back and we'll go over some more of the details and how to use it, as well as we have content already out, so you don't have to wait. Go back and watch some of our previous interviews and how to, as I've demonstrated how to use it. Also, a shout out to our friends over at Instant House Call. I use Instant House Call for remote access, it's how I help my customers. If you have any need for remote access, especially if you're a technician, you really need to check out Instant House Call if you haven't before, or if you haven't in a while, it's been updated, like last year he updated it. It's a significant version upgrade and uh, it's much more responsive now than it was. Both the Cronus and Instant House Call do have free trials, so you can try them out and decide uh, you wanna buy it. You know, It's not one of those situations where you have to give up credit card information or anything, download the software. These companies don't play those games and we don't work with companies that do that anyway. Uh, a shout out and a thank you to all my contributors and members. Thank you to Mara for making our thumbnail and video notes. And of course, a big thank you to the folks at Minis Forum for sending us this unit for review. We'll do some more with it. <clears throat> I suspect if I put CyberLink Power Director on this, this could be a killer video editing machine. I mean, if it runs as good as, and ideally better than my 13500 in the back, that's way smaller. So, hmm. The only difference is the 13500 in the back has a Gen 5 uh, NVMe, which runs at 12,400 megabytes per second, I think. Or was that one? That one might be the slower one at 10,000 megabytes per second. But I don't know how much of that actually makes a difference in rendering. It's not like it's rendering out that much data that quickly. I think the bottleneck is my storage. So that's why I'm curious how this will perform. So what I need to do is basically have it render out the same exact project on both the 13500 and on this, and then see what the rendering time difference is, whether or not there's any difference, or if it's a major difference one way or the other. Inquiring minds want to know. So this has the potential to be my new editing rig. As for all the networking ports on it, I don't have use for that. In fact, uh, the machine in the back is on Wi-Fi because I don't have any cables running through Studio B here. So uh, this has built-in Wi-Fi. We'll probably just end up using that. And we won't even use any of the networking ports if I end up using it as a video editor. So it holds a lot of promise. The first thing I'm going to do once I'm done here today is I'm going to break out whatever tools I need. I guess it's not the soldering iron. I'm going to need something with that black wire back. But very minor little repair. Then, of course, put the cover back on. And I still have to go through the Windows updates, which I've not done with you guys. We've been busy doing all this other stuff. So thank you to everybody for hanging out with me. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great weekend. I have a bunch of new content um, just waiting in the wings. We have a um, one, two, three more minis forum sees to get to. None of them are as extreme as this. A little more probably um, down to earth from a home user's perspective. Uh, if you're interested in home lab though, this thing, oof, what a beast. Mara says she added the chipset to the notes, chipset information. Thank you again uh, to Maralina. And thank you to all of the supporters and members. And if you're new here, we hope that you'll stick around and join us. If you're watching the videos after they've aired, you're missing out on the interaction, right? Because if you're watching them after they aired, it's just like watching a TV show. If you join us in a live chat, then you're a part of the show. It's far more enjoyable to be a part of the show 
than to watch other people <laughs> being a part of the show. We hope you'll join us just as long as you're not a jerk. You're welcome to join us. We'd love for our community to continue to grow with other like-minded individuals, regardless of gender, age, religion, race. None of that matters. Just our passion and our intrigue in learning more about technology. Um, you are always welcome in our chat room. It doesn't cost anything. Now, we do have a membership for $9.99 a month that helps pay for the content. And in this case, Minis Forum sent us the machine for free. So what I paid for was $300 for that RAM that we put in here. Uh, I also ordered uh, another U.2 drive. So I just got one used off of eBay. We're on a budget here. We're trying to stretch that money as much as we can so we can bring you um, the most thorough content possible. That's why these videos are so long. I don't want it to be a quick overview. I want to be thorough about it. And I want you to know exactly what to expect if you decide you want to order one or know exactly why you wouldn't want to order one, right? I want to be that clear with these reviews. And um, in order to do that, I have to sometimes buy extra parts or things like that. And your contributions and your memberships are mostly, the vast majority of which are what's paying for that equipment. So I can't thank you enough for it. In addition, when you're a member, I do a video for members only every Monday at 1 o'clock Phoenix time. Now that's 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. And only members can see the videos and only members can interact in those videos. Those videos are never ever made public. There is some unique content specifically for my members is my way of showing thank you back to them for supporting us. We'd love to have you as a member. It's a month to month thing to cancel at any time. And all the previous shows that uh, I've aired for members only, once you're a member, you can go back and see all the shows you've missed. Um, outside of that, you know, the shows are free. Feel free to continue to watch them. I hope if you enjoy the content, you give it a thumbs up. I hope that uh, if you enjoy the content, you'll hit the subscribe button. And then after hitting the subscribe button, click the little bell notification, uh, bell icon. That'll turn your notifications on to let you know anytime I'm posting new content. So every Monday at one o'clock Phoenix time, posting a video live to members, members only. Every Friday at one o'clock Phoenix time, as we've done today, I do a big project. It could be a build or sort of an over the top machine review. Something usually quite pricey happens on Fridays. And then I broadcast as my schedule permits because I'm still working as a computer repair technician. I, in fact, I've got a customer's laptop I have to work on after this as well. Um, and I try and balance all of this. So depending on what my time schedule looks like for the week, I may broadcast on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays and Sundays. And the only way you'll know on those off days is if you have your subscription notifications turned on. So I was just looking here in my OBS settings, because I have a little graphic on the screen. Here it is. Yeah, so that you can, uh, the thumbs up doesn't really do anything other than tells me you like this kind of content and you'd like to see more of it. It also tells YouTube what kind of content you like so it can um, make recommendations of other videos in the same genre. At the same time, thumbs down, again, it's not hurting anything. What it does is it tells the YouTube algorithm, you don't want to see videos like this. And then the subscribe button, that's how you get, uh, you hit the bell icon. That's how you get notified of any, any time I go live or post new content. As I mentioned, I took all four parts of the Segotep Slath Mini ITX build that I just wrapped up a few days ago, and all four parts are nine hours. <laughs> so I posted a nine hour video. Uh, it's not available yet because YouTube is still processing it in 4K, but uh, that will be released probably this weekend. One more video before bed, mom. Just nine hours long. 
Uh, all right, that'll wrap it up for me for today. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks again to our friends at Acronis, at RoboForm, at Instant House Call, and our friends at VIP CDK Deals, where we have uh, Windows and Office keys that are totally legal and legit at a extreme, extremely discounted price, guaranteed. In fact, anytime I'm promoting a product here, it is guaranteed. And if you have any issues with any of the products that I'm endorsing here, reach out to me personally. You shouldn't have to. If you have any problems, they should take, any of these folks will take care of you. If there's some reason they're not, you reach out to me directly. The buck stops with me. It's so a rest assured, there's no risk involved. The products are guaranteed. All right, that'll wrap it up for me. I will see you all very, very soon. Have a safe, happy weekend, and bye for now.